You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Nelson. Tonight, uh, folks, we're going to take you right directly to Phoenix for tonight's Metal Report with Gene Miller. Good evening, Gene. Good evening, Bill. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Snowing here. Snow on the ground everywhere. Is it? Yes. No snow here in Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> well, gold today had a high of 379.70 and a low of 376.40. To close at 3.78, down two dollars and thirty cents. Silver had a high of 5.23, a low of 5.14. To close at 5.21, up four cents. Uh, the Dow had a high of 39.11.60, a low of 38.86.60. To close at 39.11.60, up twenty-four dollars and twenty cents. Um, something that I found very, very interesting the other day, and I wanted to read this to the listening audience tonight. I think uh, uh, something they need to be aware of, uh, uh, and I'll be glad, more than glad to, uh, uh, people at Swiss America here will be more than glad to make this available to you. It's how the cops can seize your property, and that's how the title of the article. And it says, if you pick up any Wednesdays, USA Today and turn to Section D, you'll find a full page of cash, cars, and real estate that the Drug Enforcement Administration has seized under its Property Confiscation Authority. But all this stuff belonged to the drug dealers, and they had it coming, right? Wrong. Those listed in the government, uh, those listed the government is careful to point out, are not necessarily criminal defendants or suspects, nor does the appearance of their names in this notice necessarily mean that they are target they are the target of DEA investigations or other activities. According to Jarrett Wilstein, Associated Editor of Financial Privacy Report, police seize the property of an estimated five thousand innocent persons every week. Agencies now confiscating property from innocent Americans, says Wilstein, include the FBI, the Coast Guard, the Food and Drug Administration, the U.S. Postal Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Security Exchange Commission, and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as well as thousands of state and local police departments. Uh, Volusia County, Florida, police routinely ask people stop for traffic violations how much money they're carrying. Wilstein says if motors, motorists have more than a few hundred dollars on them, the money is seized on the grounds of suspicious behavior. Police also seize jewelry and expensive cars. In the last four years, Wilstein says these legalized highway robberies have brought in $8 million. Even the even paying for airline tickets can be dangerous now. It says the DEA and local police operate surveillance units at all major airports. According to Wilstein, virtually everyone you deal with at an airport, from the ticket dealer, ticket clerks to the baggage handlers, is paid a 10% bounty for turning you in to the DEA if you buy a ticket with cash or if you look even suspicious. The CBS program 60 Minutes sent a well-dressed reporter to the airports in several major cities where he purchased tickets with cash. In every instance, DEA agents were waiting to seize his money. The feds also keep a watchful eye on patrons of major hotels around the country and have installed uh, surveillance cameras at agricultural supply houses and require salesmen to keep records of people who buy grow lights hoping to spot pot farms. Uh, Wilston report, Wilstein reports. Local police are, are no slouches either. T- 
Texas officers arrested a 49-year-old woman at Houston's Hobby Airport uh, five years ago when a drug dog scratched at her luggage, Wilstein says. A search revealed no drugs, but did turn up $39,110 in cash, money from an insurance settlement, and the 20-year or the woman's 20-year savings. Uh, the, the woman was charged with no crime and was brought or was able to document the origin of the money. The cops kept it anyway. Uh, though not mentioned by Will Stein, the case of Donald P. Scott shows law enforcement at its worst. Using an improperly obtained search warrant, 30 local and federal law enforcement officers broke down the door of Scott's California home in 19, October of 1992. When Scott, armed with a pistol, went to check on the commotion, the cops killed him in supposedly self-defense. They, uh, they said the suspect, they said the sus they suspected Scott of growing marijuana, but no marijuana was found. After an exhaustive investigation, Ventura County District Attorney Michael Bradley concluded that the raid was motivated at least in part by a desire to seize and forfeit the ranch for the government. The DA's report adds this chilling tidbit. In order to seize and forfeit profit property under either California or federal law, there is no requirement that an individual be arrested or even charged criminally. You may have thought the Constitution protected you against unreasonable searches and seizures and kept the government from taking your property without due process of law. These are mere words on paper, words increasingly discarded by what some people, including yours truly on especially gloomy days, suspect is the vanguard of a police state. Folks, we better wake up. Ditto. <laughs> I mean, uh, it is on your doorstep, and uh, you're inviting them in the door. Uh, we at Sister America, if you like, will make this available to you. Uh, give us a call, 1-800-289-2646. Uh, you know, Bill and, and myself and others have been, you know, preaching this for, for a long time now, folks, and you need to do something. You need to get off your duff and give us a call and get, get yourself prepared because it is here. It's not something that's coming. It's here. It's now. It's today. And I hope this scares the pants off of you and and and, uh, and wakes you know wakes you up. Uh, you know, like Bill says, we don't need any more sheep out there. Let's let's wake up and uh, smell the coffee. Well, thank you, uh, Gene, and uh, we'll look forward to your report on uh, next Monday. Okay, sir. Good night. Good night. Call one eight hundred two eight nine two six four six. Ask for a copy of that report. Also, check in to folks protecting yourselves with the only thing that's ever protected you throughout the history of the world, precious metals in its various forms. Call now, 1-800-289-2646. 1-800-289-2646. Now I'm going to let you in on a few little secrets that you need to know. Delta. Delta. The name of the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. In form, it is a triangle and was considered by the ancient Egyptians a symbol of fire and also of God. In the Scottish and French systems and also that of the Knights Templar, the triangle or delta is the symbol of the unspeakable name. I-N-R-I. In effect, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Idirum, which means Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The inscription which was placed upon the cross of the Savior. In the philosophical lodge, they represent fire, salt, sulfur, and mercury. In the system of the Rosicrucians, they had a similar use. Igne, natura, renovature, integra. Which literally transfer means, by fire, nature is perfectly renewed. This idea is also found in the degree of knights, adepts of the eagle, or the sun. Don't go away. From the Rose Cross College, which is a resume of the teachings and proceedings of the Rose Cross College during its session held in the month of October 1916 on the 400th anniversary of the founding of the order, 
the imperialistic council and venerable order of the Magi, its instructions and the official degree, priests of Melchizedek, the knights of chivalry, and order of the Holy Grail. Edited by R. Swinburne Clymer, October, and copyrighted 1917, published at Beverly Hall, Quakertown, Pennsylvania. At the close of the June convocation of the Rose Cross Order and Sacred College, it became evident that a convocation of the Sacred College and the Order of the Magi would be necessary in October in order to continue the work and commemorate the anniversary of the foundation of the Rose Cross Order dating from the year 1516. On the second day of June, special letters of invitation were mailed to all members privileged to be present at the October convocation and arrangements started so that not only might lectures be given every day during the entire month of October while the college was in session, but that ancient degrees, sons of Osiris, might also be conferred as they had been during the month of June upon the delegates then present. Information had been received at headquarters from different sources that men without any authority whatever were using the name of the Magi, men who were not and never had been on the rolls of the order. Acting upon this information, it was considered best that special effort should be made to convene the order during the sacred college session, and when convened, the official degree, Priests of Melchizedek, should be conferred upon all who were eligible. During July, it became evident that if the work in several large cities were to go forward, leaders should be officially ordained. With this in view, the following notices were mailed to the members of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated. My dear brother, in accordance with the power vested in me as president of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, and at the request of the Order of the Illuminati, degree Knights of the Rose Cross, I herewith invite you to be present at a special session of the Association to begin October 1st and end October 30th, 1916. At this special session of the Association, a convening of the Sacred Rose Cross College shall be called, and besides the regular work of the College when in session, the special work of ordaining two members of the fraternity, namely Mr. Charles C. Brown, Buffalo, New York, and Mr. A. W. Witt, Kansas City, Missouri, in accordance with the provision in the bylaws of the corporation to wit. Quote, this corporation shall have the power to call a convocation at any time, and when so convened shall have the power to select teachers and to ordain such teachers to the ministry as shall in their opinion be fitted for the position. And such ordained men shall have the power and the right to officiate at weddings and at funerals, and possess all such other powers as ministers of God usually possess. In accordance with the laws made and provided for in our corporation, we issue this invitation that you may be present. God be with you. Fraternally yours. Signed, R. Swinburn, Clymer, President. All arrangements having been completed during the months of July, August, and September, the delegates began arriving on the last day of September, and on the first day of October, nearly all had arrived who were to be present during the first session. On October the 2nd, the Sacred College was called to order and lectures being given in the forenoon, afternoon, and evening of each day by those who had prepared papers. Before the morning lecture, a private session was held, presided over by Charles C. Brown of the Buffalo College, and conducted in the manner of the private classes at College in Buffalo, New York. On the evening of October the 11th, all the delegates repaired to the Grove of Osiris, where the three degrees, ancient mysteries of Osiris, were conferred upon those delegates not previously initiated. The music especially prepared for the entire ritual being furnished by Miss Daisy T. Grove of Buffalo, New York. After these ceremonies, all repaired to the hall where a dinner was served to all. On the night of the 12th of October, the delegates met in the Rose Cross Chapel, and after the Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi had opened in due form and finished its official business, the official degree Priests of Melchizedek was conferred upon all those present. Following the conferring of this degree, the Council closed and a special official session of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, was called to order. 
After the opening of the business session of the association, the official letter mailed to members was read by the acting secretary, Miss Vera H. Barr, and approved by officers and members present. It was then moved and seconded that Mr. A. W. Witt of Kansas City, Missouri, should be ordained to the ministry in harmony with the corporate powers. Mr. Witt was called upon to make his confession of faith and allegiance to the Church of Illumination and to read the thesis prepared for that purpose. The ordination in due form followed. After the ordination of Mr. Witt, the following resolutions passed by the officers of the corporation in special session on March 10, 1916, were officially approved by all members present. First, because certain people without authority from this corporation or from the true Rose Cross order long established in America have started organizations calling themselves Rosicrucian but without any Rosicrucian teachings and directly in conflict with Rosicrucian laws and usages, it has become urgent that the Royal Fraternity Association shall issue a certificate of membership good for one year to every student who enrolls with any one or other of such orders or fraternities. The fee for such membership certificates shall be 25 cents to cover cost of issue and clerk hire. At the expiration of one year, the holder thereof shall make application for a new certificate. All such certificates shall be on record in the office of the president of the corporation. Any student expelled from the order makes void his certificate unless reinstated. Any member of any body in fraternal relation with the Royal Fraternity Association may, on the payment of a fee of 25 cents, have a certificate issued to him recognized by the fraternities affiliated with this corporation. These rules to go into effect immediately. It is regrettable that such rules and regulations are necessary. Not less than six different associations have sprung in existence calling themselves Rosicrucian, without a shred of Rosicrucian teachings, and three other associations calling themselves Magi or Melchizedek, without any authority of any Magi, and all of them years after the institution of the legitimate bodies. Furthermore, when six members of the Black Brotherhoods have enrolled in the true fraternities within a year to gain secrets to be used by the Black Brotherhoods, we realize the importance of strict rules. For this reason, the Royal Fraternity Association as a protecting body became a necessity. Following the session of the Imperialistic Council of the Magi and the session of the Royal Fraternity Association, a midnight dinner, the October Feast of the Gods, was partaken of by those present. On the night of October 13th, after the opening of the official session of the corporation, the following resolution, voiced by the chairman and seconded by Reverend A.W. Witt, was passed. Under the Royal Fraternity Association, during the convocation of the Sacred College, that the Order of Knighthood, known as Knights of Chivalry, Order of the Holy Grail, be reinstituted, that at this meeting one Sir Knight should be created by the Grand Sir Knight, and that this Sir Knight should select his lady for the coming year, and that during the year following this Sir Knight should select men either within or without the order, that at the next June convocation of the Sacred College, such men selected by him, and not more than nine, attend the Sacred College convocation and be created knights. Those in turn to select their ladies, either from within or without the order, but from within if possible. Only men of the highest standing to be selected, men of the highest moral character, men chivalric towards womanhood. Each man must study and be familiar with the labors of chivalry, legends of the Holy Grail or Holy Graal, and the Golden Fleece of the Jason Society. After the first year that a certain number of men worthy of the honor be selected, also ladies to the same number, the total of men knights not to exceed 199 during the first seven years. That the first one to be selected and created a Sir Knight be August Rue, spelled R-H-U, medical doctor of Marion, Ohio, because of high attainments in his profession and the favorable aspects of the heavens to his nativity and of the prophecy made by those who know. Biography, August Rue, Marion, Ohio, specialty surgery and gynecology. Born in Seneca County, Ohio. Graduated from Western Reserve University, Medical Department, Cleveland, Ohio, 1885. Fellow American College of Surgeons, 1914. Yearly special course in surgery and medicine since 1885. 
is also an author. Immediately upon the passing of these articles, Dr. Rue was created a Sir Knight and selected as his lady-in-waiting for the year, M. Alice Reese, spelled R-E-E-S-E, -E, of Kansas City, Missouri, who was then knighted as a lady. R. Swinburne Clymer, as Grand Sir Knight, was ordered to prepare rules and regulations for the Sir Knights after ancient usages. On the 15th day of October, the first session of the Sacred College came to a close, and the delegates returned to their homes. The officers remained for the second session. The second session of the Sacred College was called to order on the 16th of October, at which time the delegates had arrived for the second session. Lectures at once began and continued for the rest of the month. On the evening of the 17th of October, those present repaired to the Grove of Osiris and had conferred upon them the ancient degrees of Osiris, in like manner as that conferred upon the delegates of the first session. The midnight dinner, Feast of the Gods, followed the conferring of the degrees, followed by the usual social session. On the night of the 18th of October, the delegates and officers repaired to the Rose Cross Temple, and after the imperialistic council of the Magi had come to order, the ancient degree, Priests of Melchizedek, was conferred upon them. After closing the temple in due form, an official session of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated, was called to order. Charles C. Brown of Buffalo, New York, was brought before the session and requested to make his confession of faith and allegiance to the Church of Illumination and read his thesis. He was then ordained to the ministry in due form. After Mr. Brown had been ordained and the business of the corporation brought to a close, a dinner was served to those present. Lectures continued thrice daily with a special session, each forenoon, led by Rev. C. C. Brown until the night of October 24th, when word was received that Joseph A. Walter, 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite of the Buffalo, New York Consistory, A. A. Scottish Rite, a brother of the Order, Fraternity Sons of Osiris, would arrive that day. On his arrival, the Imperialistic Council and Venerable Order of the Magi convened, and the ancient degree Priest of Melchizedek was conferred upon Mr. Walter, followed by the official dinner in his honor. Of the lectures given during the month of October, only a limited number can be given. The dedication service to be used in all ceremonies of ordination to the ministry in the Church of Illumination was prepared by the writer some years ago and symbolic of the path taken by the neophytes desiring to reach illumination. The article concerning the Magi and the work on the order of knighthood, with exceptions as noted, are from the same pen. With the exception of the Church of Illumination, the thesis prepared by Rev. Charles C. Brown, no other lectures were given by him as he conducted the private classes during the time of the convocation. Our work was prepared by Rev. A. W. Witt as his thesis for ordination, and the all-seeing eye is by the same writer. The lecture, Origin of Symbolism and Eugenics, as taught by the Sacred College, are by Grace Kincaid Morey, a graduate of Oberlin College, Secretary of the Buffalo Rose Cross College, and Secretary of the Royal Fraternity Association, Incorporated. The All-Seeing Eye is by Wayne E. Cake, who has given the subject consideration from the standpoint of a Freemason. Eugenics, a lecture by Clara Witt, the Acting Secretary of the Rose Cross College of Kansas City, Missouri, a writer on eugenics and the sacredness of motherhood in the various Masonic magazines of the Middle West. Obedience, a lecture by M. Alice Reese, who was knighted as lady to August Rue before mentioned. The Christ Birth is a lecture delivered by Vera H. Barr, one of the teachers of the Kansas City College and assistant to Rev. A. W. Witt. The Power of Thought by Mrs. John W. Cook should have careful consideration by all students as we recognize that thought is the base of all action. These are but very few of the many lectures delivered during the sessions of the Sacred College and are given because they are fundamental and show the practical scope of the great work. The next convocation of the Sacred College is called for May 15, 1917, to be held in three sessions. Besides the regular lecture course, all the ancient degrees will be conferred, and in addition, the Temple of Philishan degrees. Fraternally given, R. Swinburne Clymer, Beverly Hall, November 25, 1917.
1916. Ladies and gentlemen, what you're going to hear tonight is going to be just the beginning of the revelation that those who believe in a master race, those who believe in the theory of white supremacy, those who believe that the Anglo-Aryan race are the true Israelites will discover that they have been conned, they have been scammed, and they are part of an attempt to destroy the United States of America and bring the world once again under the rule of Great Britain. So you had better pay attention. The doctrine, the doctrine of Christian identity, ladies and gentlemen, and of the British Israelite stems directly from the mysteries. It is one of the biggest scams that has ever been put across to the American people. And all of you who are taking part in it, all of you who are taking part in it, are, for all intents and purposes, calling Jesus Christ a liar. You are also helping in a great plan to destroy this great nation and bring about a one-world totalitarian socialist government upon the face of this earth. And if you listen carefully and take notes, and if you go to the sources that we give you, you will discover this on your own. And if you study your own history, if you are of Aryan or Anglo descent, you will discover that there is no Hebrew root in your language. You will discover that your ancestors were primitive, fierce, terrible tribesmen who indulged in human sacrifice and worshipped the sun in temples such as Stonehenge. And if you're smart, if you're smart, you will join all those people in the world who want freedom, irregardless of their race, color, or creed. You will stop buying in to the Helgelian dialectic of divide and conquer, in which they separate us, feed us lies, and send us off to kill each other, while they place the chains about our ankles. Don't go away, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be right back after this very short pause. You know. Well, if you think that that's not important or has no bearing upon what you're hearing, ladies and gentlemen, continue to listen. Take the doctrine out of your head that you don't want to hear the facts because you already know what you believe. Take the pin labeled Archie Bunker off of the front of your shirt and throw it in the trash can and pay attention and get smart and wise up. Stop being sheeple. The Order of the Holy Grail. Few people are acquainted with the fact that the flower of manhood in France and England belonged to knighthoods founded ages ago their object being the recognition of and the homage due womanhood. These orders bear the names of Knights of the Garter in England, whose insignia is the Garter, and Knights of France, represented by the Fleur de Lis. Both these orders, ladies and gentlemen, were founded by men belonging to an older and nobler order, Knights of the Holy Grail, who took advantage of a trivial circumstance to establish these orders for the protection of womanhood. Though the knights were in search of the Holy Grail, their own soul, the Grail represents their own soul, they were ever ready to fight for their country, for womanhood, and the sacred mysteries. Other orders dating back many periods of time under different names and emblems entertained the same high-minded chivalric motives. The motto of the Knights of the Garter, Onai Soi Qui Malia Pins, translated, reads, Evil to him who evil thinks. This phrase fell from the lips of Edward III as he penned the garter, 
guard her to his arm. To the initiated, this motto takes on a deeper meaning. In its most exalted purity, it was used by knights centuries before the Christian era. The garter is a feminine emblem, supposedly unseen unless by accident. A mishap to a noted countess caused the garter to become the insignia of one of the great orders in history. The greatest movements of an age often appear accidental. The fleur-de-lis is also an emblem of woman, and most of the symbols of the present and earlier ages are characteristic of eternal feminine. Centuries before Jesus walked the earth, members of sacred and honorable orders held the lingam sacred. In time, the lingam worship became degraded, not by the members of those orders, but by the people who came to understand something of the outer mysteries and degraded them. Now I want you to look up the meaning of the word lingam. L-I-N-G-U-M. The faith of both Christian and Catholic devotees is symbolized by emblems of sex. The Christian cross indicates the male and the heart, that of the opposite sex. Both cross and heart are creative or phallic emblems. There is nothing greater or higher in the universe of God than creative power. The power that can create can also recreate and regenerate. If we honor the Creator, why not the created creation? All the wisdom, philosophy underlying the knights of the different orders and the mythologies was based upon creative power. Probably the most beautiful and purest of mythological stories is that of Eros and Psyche, the story of the soul and its earth career. As all Sir Knights are expected to read mythology, it is not necessary to give details but simply call attention to the esoteric meaning of this supposed myth. Aphrodite, or Venus, the fairest queen in the Greek heaven of the immortal gods, was subject to pride and jealousy and demanded homage because of her sex and beauty. Psyche, the soul, untainted by sin, was possessed of a beauty far more attractive and compelling than the mere physical beauty of Aphrodite. The inference is plain. They were rivals. In her innocence, Psyche worshipped Artemis, or purity, the deity of virgins. She had no desire to attend the festivals of Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, because she knew not of love and beauty. This gave offense not only to the priestess, but to her parents as well. The parents called by us temptation, which is the beginning of all knowledge, induced her to appear before the goddess in all her purity and innocence. The worshippers fell down before her. Such obeisance to another beauty roused the anger and jealousy of Aphrodite, who vowed vengeance on the radiant Psyche. Not having sinned, only listened to temptation, Psyche was really not subject to punishment. The soul that listens to the voice of the flesh is not necessarily punished for that which follows, but because of passive resistance it permits itself further temptation. Aphrodite, symbol of earth mother and procreation, resented the adulation bestowed upon innocence. If the worship of men turned from the priestess of love and passion to that which was chaste and immaculate, how could she people the earth and thereby obtain new worshippers? Brooding over this condition, she called her son Eros, or Cupid, the god of love, that beautiful emotion which enters into the heart of all created things, and bade him seek Psyche and arouse in her the desire of love and passion. She commanded him to keep himself inviolate, not taking into consideration the great law of the universe, which demands a just return for all things given or received. Eros, god of love, the law of love itself, retired to do his mother's bidding. Meanwhile, Psyche was lamenting the fate of her loneliness. The maidens about her were being taken in marriage, while she, the fairest, was left uncourted. Like the soul that listens to temptation, she had become an inhabitant of the realm of unrest and longing. No longer single-minded in her worship 
of Artemis, she was not yet possessed with the desire of love and passion, that state of feeling that would transform the worship of the gods into a longing to possess her. Eros was thus commissioned to bring this about. The temptations, not resisted in the life of the soul, bring about the unhappiness to which it is subjected. But at the same time, it is the fate of temptation to bequeath knowledge to the soul. Obedience to the tempter results in wrongdoing and sorrow, but it opens the way to wisdom and light. Before the edict of Aphrodite could be carried out, she decreed that Psyche should leave the abode of the gods. When the soul, in its untried purity, listens to temptation, it closes the doors of heaven against itself, and must then prepare for its journey earthward. Death is its portion, or, as Psyche was told, she would espouse a monster. When the soul first comes within the influence of the earth life, it is not conscious of the restrictions of matter, nor the laws that confine it there. Psyche awoke to a new existence. To her surprise, she found herself surrounded by a realm of beauty with the promised monster nowhere in sight. But her happiness, her content, was of a passive nature. For though banished from the heaven of innocence, she was not awakened to the power and thraldom of passion. Not having actually sinned, she was not in possession of the knowledge of self. She heard the call of love, but saw no form. In answer to her question, Eros answered that it was love, her husband. The perplexed Psyche could not be satisfied with mere assurances of love. The insistent call of the imprisoned soul for knowledge, through all the senses, demanded recognition. She must see love. Love without passion does not satisfy mankind. It is a state of feeling undemonstrated. The urge in man must know, see, feel, and possess. Eros informed Psyche that because of an unalterable decree, she would never behold his face. Only in darkness could he come to her. Only in secrecy could she know his embrace. To accept love as it is offered, to live surrounded by love, with thoughts unmixed with doubt or suspicion, would lift the soul to the heaven of happiness and immortality. Man, in his attempt to dissect and analyze, opens the way to grief and pain, worry and fear, doubt and misfortune. As darkness falls, or as the soul sinks deeper into the realm of matter, it feels the presence of unseen shapes about it. Fear contends with love, while passion awaits nearby. But Eros, love, makes himself heard through the veil of flesh, and whispers, Fear not, though the darkness of night surround thee, flesh covering the soul, I am with thee. My love shall sustain and protect thee. No matter where thou goest, to heaven or hell, thou art mine, my beloved, as I am thine, for I am love, the delight of the world, the giver of life. With love in the soul there is nothing to fear. When the soul is supported by love, evil is powerless. Love not only gives life, not only bequeaths youth, health, and strength, but molds and perfects mankind. As Psyche received Eros, love, a thrill of joy, passed through her. She opened her arms to the tender form of the lovely youth and cried, Who art thou that takest pity on one doomed to be a sacrifice to the most terrible monster of the demons of hell? Eros answered, Fear not the monster of whom the oracle spoke. I am thy husband. I am he before whom both gods and fiends have reason to tremble. Love, supreme, is the husband of the soul. It may lead its spouse to the innermost shrine of heaven. Its shadow, lust, may lead to the lowest round of hell. So often mistaken for love, lust roams the earth, seducing, betraying, destroying womanhood. This unspeakable evil was the demon, the dragon, the monster, for which the knights of the grail were banded together to slay. 
all illnesses of women stem from the lust of men. Love supreme is the husband of the soul. Psyche, still fearful, replies, Why, if thou art death, that fearful ruler of the land of shades, whom even the mighty Zeus dreads, why comest thou in so pleasing a disguise? Thy voice is music, thy breath the perfume of roses, and the touch of thy lips enraptures me. What shall I call thee? The answer of Eros, Call me love is a light set in the midst of darkness. Love dissipates the blackness and unreality of death, disintegrates carnal, sensual desires. The love encircled soul is able to resist destroying passions. It slays the dragon in its sacrifice to gain that which is real. Interpreted in another way, death in the pleasing disguise of reward and release kisses the lips of the weary bids the soul fear not, and liberates it from the thraldom of earth. Love presides at birth, for through it the soul descends to earth, and its consequent experiences and lessons. Love presides at death, for through it the soul ascends to freedom, peace, and joy. O love and death, O death and love, how wondrous kin ye are, the planet Venus thus at once is evening, and morning star. O love and death, O death and love, life ended, life begun. The sun may rise, the sun may set, tis still the self-same sun. Life's problem here at last is solved. Step in, the door's ajar. O love and death, O death and love, how wondrous kin ye are. Psyche and Eros lived happily together, even though the strangeness of life caused her momentary fear. The soul, surrounded by the darkness, the unreality of earth, seems bound to question the promises of love. Still, unless haunted by the phantoms of doubt and suspicion, the soul retains a general state of peace and happiness. But as time passed, the variety and newness of love waned, and doubt and suspicion became easy to entertain. Eros granted Psyche entire freedom in the selection of her guests, stipulating only that he be not questioned. The generosity and goodness of Eros roused the phantoms to a more spirited action. They urged her to insist upon knowing whom her husband really was. Surrounded by secrecy, how did she know that he was wholly hers? Could she depend upon him to supply her every need? With these questions and inferences, they opened the door to the most deadly of the phantom sisterhood, jealousy. The carnal mind, insisting upon proofs that can be seen and felt, refuses unseen verities. Mind immersed in materiality prefers a chaos of fact and objectivity to a cosmos of harmony and beauty. Eros, noting the perplexity, uncertainty, and unrest of Psyche, following the visits of the fiends disguised as friends, warned her, I beseech thee to be on thy guard, not only for the sake of our happiness, but because of the child immorality. Thou shalt bear me. If thy guests importune torment and worry thee to discover my identity and thou succumb I shall leave thee it is beyond my power to oppose the will of the gods now I mispronounce the name of the child it's immortality not immorality immortality Psyche replied that with him near happiness enveloped her his touch filled her with aspiration and trust. His voice, as the wings of faith, lifted her to the realms of peace and security, but often she felt alone, and the group of sisters, though ugly, entertained her. It came about that inquisitiveness and fear were added to the brood that daily haunted the heart psyche. Surrounded by their influence, Eros was helpless. Though possessed of the power of the gods, 
love cannot dwell in the heart of suspicion. At last, unable to resist the combined influence of the demons, Psyche was persuaded to take her lamp, steal quietly into the chamber of Eros, and gaze upon the face of her beloved. As it lay revealed, a drop of oil caused him to awaken. At the instant of revelation, beholding a being of wondrous youth and beauty, she knew her fears, doubts, and suspicions to be groundless. At the moment of realization that she had possessed all that heart and life could desire because of a broken law, it was taken from her. The fiend of disobedience had completed her undoing. Psyche, Psyche, thou hast betrayed me. Now must I leave thee. Alone shalt thou suffer from the intrigues of thine enemies. Eros and Psyche parted. Love and soul were divided. In other words, soul, because of questionings, unbeliefs, doubts, unrest, severed itself from the heaven of faith, peace, and happiness. This is the story and the reason of the pilgrimage of the soul on the earth plain. How often is this story repeated in the homes of thousands today? Faith, security, happiness, bartered for doubts, suspicions, and jealousies. Psyche, adrift, despairing, was bereft of all things but hope. Having discovered the destructive power of evil thought, she turned about to win back the love, the heaven she had forfeited. To human justice it would seem that now Aphrodite, divine law, would relent having witnessed the undoing of Psyche, but not so. The pain and suffering and longing of Psyche could in no wise mitigate her punishment. Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. To have reinstated Psyche among the gods would presuppose a power greater than law, which could nullify or soften its own edicts. Law is not annulled when all is lost through obedience, disobedience. Law is not annulled when all is lost through disobedience. Through pain and travail does one gradually win back their lost estate. Now Psyche called upon all the gods to aid her in recovering love. Her prayers and supplications failed to reach that high heaven, for a broken law becomes an impenetrable wall between an entreaty and its fulfillment. Hera, wife of Zeus, queen of heaven, and knowing all things, that goddess who dwelt near earth, and presided over married life, pitied Psyche, saying, Would that I could present thy petition unto Zeus, mighty ruler of all men. That cannot be, for the word of Aphrodite is powerful, and her decrees inviolable. Thou hast brought about this thy fate. Endure the trials that shall come upon thee. Believe thou shalt dwell again in heaven, and work out thine own salvation." Psyche, whose one desire was to recover the delight and happiness of the past, endured the trials. She accepted the punishments. She passed the tests imposed upon her. As the reality of the statement became apparent to her that, to the soul without love all is empty and hopeless, she turned as to a friend to the god of death, that monster whom she had most dreaded and begged him to take her to the realm of Hades. The performance of that journey was the extreme penance for disobedience. And in the willingness to suffer death, in the willingness to be purged of all sin, she brought about her release, for she had paid the uttermost farthing. Now hearing of the voluntary journey of Psyche that she might regain love, Eros flew to her assistance, liberating her from the Stygian slumber, awakening her to life and love and youth. Ah, Psyche, thou most perished to atone for thy fault. Knowest thou not that only the gods can pass and repass the river Styx? To them it is a fountain of youth, but if mortals drink of it, it binds them to the wheel of birth and death. 
the gods recognize thy expiation and bid thee drink of this cup of immortality. Now had Psyche reproached Eros for unha her unhappiness, had she refused to place the cause of her sin and suffering upon herself, had she given up the search for lost love, the usual fate of mankind would have been hers. Unhappiness, poverty, worry, sickness, stagnation, death are the result of ceasing to search, to struggle, to conquer. The soul forfeits love and immortality through disobedience. It achieves love and immortality through faith and trust and loyalty. Death is the problem of life, but love is its solution. The search of the incarnate soul for immortality through the instrumentality of love is typified in the search of knights for the golden fleece or the holy grail. Bet you wondered where I was going. The legend of Eros and Psyche may be interpreted as the soul in search of love and immortality enduring anguish and suffering caused by the sins of fear, doubt, suspicion, and disobedience. Other legends, as unfolded in this series, will outline and reveal those inner meanings and the significations of which are of importance to the students of knighthood and chivalry, this branch of the Illuminati, which originates in the Anglo-Aryan race. In the myths, ladies and gentlemen, surrounding King Arthur and the Round Table, and of those knights of the Holy Grail who were the forerunners of the Order of the Garter and other knighthoods, and in particular of the group known as the Round Table, one particularly is worthy of interpretation demonstrating as it does the use and abuse of power. And in the second hour tonight we will tell you the story of Merlin the story, ladies and gentlemen, of Merlin. And we will continue with our revelation of where the doctrine of Christian identity, British Israelites, the master race, the people who want to rule everybody else, for in all of the lodges there is a prime, prime rule. The Anglo-Aryan race is supreme, and you will find no one of color in the lodge. Ladies and gentlemen, this scenario has been played out throughout the history of man. It has never changed. There is always someone who believes that they are the master race, that they are the only ones fit to rule and they intend to enslave everyone else, even of their own race, for their motto is if you are not one of us you are nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, in the material passed out by James Bobo Grites, Grits here, we call him Bobo Grits, Lieutenant Colonel James Bo Grites, in his spike training advertisement literature and in his spike video you will see that spike is spelled and I left it up to many of you to learn what it is on your own some of you did most of you did not S P penis of Osiris K E S P obelisk K E S P Phalus K E S P Stupid Sheeple K E You had better wake up out there and you had better do it really quick. I'll be back, folks. Nine PM Pacific, ten Mountain, eleven Central, and midnight Eastern Standard Time. Don't miss it, and if you do, tape it, and if you can't tape it, order the tapes from us. Good night, and God bless you all.